that was about uh, 1902 or three or something like that, and a ship going to uh, to Gent, that's in Belgium. So everything went smoothly until one Sunday we arrived in Gent, and uh, sailors bought us a ticket for Antwerp. Now there was four of us. One already had been to Antwerp before. He was a bit of a sailor. And uh, he was the leader, because uh, when we got to Antwerp, he took us down to the shipping quarter and found the boarding house where we got in. We had to pay uh, uh, one pound a week in advance for uh, board, which was in, uh, oh, in Russian money, but they exchanged it all right. So uh, I went there and had a good tea and good sleep, and uh, they used to keep runners that uh, run around the ship looking for jobs for you. And about a couple of days' time, the runner came to me and said, So, oh, I got a job for you on a German ship, which is uh, you got to work by in the port for a few days before signing on, uh, which is sailing uh, to the Mediterranean, to um, Italy, France, and Spain, and back to Antwerp. And, Oh, I was very happy with myself because I had no capital on me, just a few bob. We had to go to the office to sign on, and it was uh, rather a big German ship, and in the office, the officers asked, the shipping master asked me something in German, and I didn't understand what he wanted, and uh, then they looked at one another and said, oh, we can't take that man, and he, he cannot speak. So they, they pushed me aside. And uh, I was all oh, very down in the dumps, and of course went out and went quietly home. And uh, the boarding housekeeper said, uh, what's wrong with you, Bob? Oh, I said, I got rejected, I couldn't speak the language, and they wouldn't take me. So uh, in that same evening, I meet the Latvian uh, that kept the boarding house, some uh, few doors away from where I was staying. And he says, come and stay with us. There is plenty of company and a language that you can understand. So I was glad for that. And I went there and spent the first day all right. And the next morning, about 10 o'clock, the runner comes to me and puts out his hand to me and says, put it here, <laughs> old man. So I shook hands with him. I said, what's all that in the head of? He said, uh, you consider yourself very lucky. He said that ship sailed out last night, and when it got in the uh, English Channel, it collided with another one and went to the bottom with all hands. The only one was saved was a mushroom boy. <laughs> I, I couldn't speak for joy. <laughs> and I shook hands with myself. <laughs> and <laughs> Oh, it reminds me of something <laughs> very good. I was very happy that I was in one piece. So, anyway, that was all right. After a few days, he says, oh, now I got a job for you on a Dutch ship, and it's sailing to West Africa and back to Rotterdam. And he says, I think you'd get no trouble to get a board there. So, anyway, he took me along to the office, and I was duly signed on without much uh, questioning, and uh, we sailed away to Africa, across the Atlantic, and uh, and we landed in, uh, we went to uh, Port Col Dakar, up uh, on the river Senegal. Uh, it was a French possession, and we got there Sunday before dinner, and because I was a coal trimmer down below in the Stockholm, and the first few days I was sick as a dog, and I couldn't eat, and work you had to do, <laughs> and uh, so things was pretty grim, but uh, by the time we got in Dakar, I got all the sickness over and everything was all right, and um, after the ship was tied up, the chief comes down with a bottle of square face, uh, Holland's gin, and gave us a good glass full each, <laughs> and that was a good medicine, and after having this, he said, now you can knock off and go and have dinner and do as you like. So I goes up and had a good feed. And, and uh, cause when we came, we didn't go alongside. We were tied up on two floating boys out in the harbor. 
And as soon as we arrived, there was so, uh, half a dozen or so big coal hawks were towed alongside of us, and there was hundreds of niggers aboard, and <laughs> I was looking in amazement. It resembled me as if I, the uh, niggers uh, stepped out of the pages of the storybook that I used to have at home, and they were all alive and real, and all naked, curly heads and just a bit of loincloth around their middle, that was all. And uh, so after dinner I uh, clambered down on the coal hook and uh, put my hand in the water and it felt nice and warm like milk. I thought, oh well, here goes for a swim. I pulled my short off and left, left my uh, short underpants on as a swimming dog and I dived overboard. Oh, and wallowed in the water, it was lovely. And about 50 yards or so away was another floating boy, so I struck out for the boy and clambered aboard that boy and had a walk around two, three times, and a bit of cold breeze sprang up, and I started to get chilly, so I dived in the water again and made back for the ship. And when I got halfway along, I noticed the sailors was running up and down the ship's side and yelling out something to me which I couldn't understand, and shaking coils of rope to me and beckoning for me to hurry up and come ashore, uh, aboard. So I started to swim again and get to the hole, clambered up and went aboard, dried myself, put a clean short on, and then the uh, a bosun comes forward, he says, uh, Bob, you are wanted by the chief, and now you are in for it. And I had a scalded foot uh, during the voyage. I had to throw cold water on, on the red hot clinkers as they were cleaning the fires. And one day the water jumped back and got my boot full, and I had quite a bad foot. And that was bandage, because swimming I lost the bandage. And when I went back, the chief oh, gave me a bit of a dressing down in Dutch, which meant nothing much to me. And then he said, uh, uh, you should not go in the water. I said, especially with your bad foot. And uh, not only bad foot, uh, then he uh, set to work and uh, dressed it and bandaged and uh, they were living in the after end of the ship. And then he says, now you can come up. And when the, when I went up with him, he beckoned to me to go towards the back end of the ship, towards the stern. And he was leaning over and he said, pointed down to the water, he said, look at that, Bob. And I looked over and what do you think I saw? There was a couple, about 18 to 20 foot, uh, huge monsters of sharks looping the loops quietly around the propeller. And, you know, my heart come up in my throat and I nearly get choked. <laughs> and <laughs> I was in, oh, in a proper predicament. <laughs> it took quite a while until I got over and got my breath again. And then I <laughs> went like a big dog quietly uh, forward to my quarters and passing the ship's gully where the cook was uh, working in. He was a young German, and he always called me Riga. So he says, Riga, have a look at this. And he had a seven-pound soup and bulletin in his hand, and he threw it overboard with a good splash. And as soon as it splashed the water, a huge shark come up and turned over and took the tin and just squashed it as if it was made out of cardboard. Well, I don't know. I had my lesson all right. I thought to myself, now, that's twice I got out in one piece. So I said, no more water for me. So anyway, the ship was loaded full of briquettes, that's uh, kind of compressed lumps of black coal, about 10 by 5 by 4, like a big loaf of bread. And uh, convoys was rigged up outside from the hulks to the ship deck and then down the hall again. And there's hundreds of niggers standing in a row. And the briquettes were being picked up and towed to the next one and the next one to the next. And so a stream of briquettes was flowing out of the ship into the hulks until it was full. And eventually the ship was emptied. And when the ship was emptied, I don't know how many days we were there, but we had to sail up the river for about two and a half days. 
and you could only sail sail up by day and night time the ship was being tied up uh, to a tree or somewhere wherever you could tie a ship up at night the water was calm of course and uh, oh it seemed to be very weird there was all sorts of animal sounds coming like from a circus coming to me and now and again the old man lion gave out a deep roar which sent me some unwilling shiver down my backbone so um, we sailed up for about two and a half days and then there was some more niggers bringing peanuts aboard in large baskets uh, in the same manner as uh, the ship was unloaded and they were up on the ship, only emptying the peanuts uh, loose in the ship's hole until the, all the, uh, the produce was gathered up. Then we sailed further down river and got some more cargo on and further down more cargo on. The ship was full and uh, eventually it was that full, the hatches was buttoned down and the peanuts was poured down through the ventilators and they and then they covered over with some green canvas and securely tightened down so that wouldn't get wet. And of course, we sailed back, back for Europe. And we sailed back, uh, going back to Rotterdam. And uh, arriving in Rotterdam, we didn't go alongside again. The ship was tied up and a couple of boys out in the harbor. And the harbor in Rotterdam, you couldn't see from one end to the other. You look like in a in a burnt forest. You could see nothing for miles but uh, sooty ships, masts, and smokestacks. And uh, all the sailors uh, said, uh, "We'll all go back." So I joined up with them. And for some reason or other, the pay came rather late in the afternoon to pay us up and uh, the skipper wasn't aboard to give us a discharge for uh, the trip that we made, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, uh, design our character, what we were behaving like or so on. So uh, the sailor said, oh, it doesn't matter, we were only away a couple of months and it doesn't make no difference about that discharge. So uh, away we go back to Antwerp, I go to my uh, Latvian boarding house and paid um, my uh, 25 francs, which is a uh, quid a week board in advance, and oh, I was quite happy and bought a pair of new shoes and, uh, and quite a few bits and pieces, a new outfit, and I was there for about three, four days, and then the runner came one day to me, he says, I got a job for you on a, on a German ship, but you must have the discharge from the last ship. I said, I haven't got it. We left it in Rotterdam. So he says, I'll take you to the station and buy you a return ticket and you go to the on the ship and see the chief and get it and come back with it. So I said, all right. So one day after we had a good dinner, he took me to the station, bought a return ticket and put me on a train and away I goes to Rotterdam, which wasn't very far away, about two, three hours run, I think. That was all. And I landed uh, sometime, uh, well, in the afternoon in Rotterdam. And then, of course, I made for the docks. And do you think I could find the ship? No. I was running up and down, and there were ships by the thousands. And the ship's name was the Ruiter, and I blowed if I could find it. Until it got dark, and I got weary, I eventually crawled up about a two-foot in diameter drain pipe, uh, which were, there were quite a few laying on the dock side, one end slightly uphill, and the worst thing I could have done, uh, the draft was running through and I got very chilly, and I spent a terribly miserable night in the pipe, and before daylight I crawled out and started to run up and down to get my joints uh, a bit uh, worked in and warmed up, and uh, it wasn't to my surprise, just as the sun was coming up, I looked over and I see the Reuter laying not very far from where I've been running a dozen times yesterday and couldn't find it. So the, the, the boatman uh, with the uh, horse and boats pulling the workmen aboard ship and uh, I hopped into one and asked him whether he'd go to the Reuter. He said yes. 
uh, when we get halfway to the ship, he puts out his hat. He says, uh, one golden, please. That was something in English money about the value of one and six. And uh, I thought I just barely had about one and six in my pocket. Uh, a different uh, copper coin, some Dutch, some Belgium, some French, and uh, an English sixpence. And, and uh, anyway... Uh, I had to hang on tight to that. I didn't know uh, how I was going to get on because I was hungry. I had nothing to eat. And knowing that I had no money, you see, I couldn't go and buy anything to eat. I was hungry as a hound. And <laughs> uh, eventually when I was I was sitting on the... As soon as I got on the ship, I went to the ship's uh, galley, you know, where they cook the dinner. The stove was cold, and I hunted through every cupboard, and there was not a scrap of anything to eat. And I was still getting as hungry as anything, and about 10 o'clock came, and the workman sat down to have a smoker, and one joker sort of looked suspicious at me, and handed his sandwiches over to me. He thought I was hungry, and of course, <laughs> I went for it like a big dog, and thanked him for it, and oh, he said, don't mention it's all right. So I uh, greedily ate that and still waited and waited until about 11 o'clock the uh, chief engineer came aboard and I told him my plight and uh, oh, he said, I'm sorry, I haven't got nothing to eat either, but I didn't tell him that I didn't have any money. So uh, he went down and uh, wrote out the discharge and uh, came up again and said, I have to take it ashore to to a place called Waterscout in Holland, in uh, Rotterdam. That's sort of a water police. So I goes ashore with one of those uh, cargo hulks, which cost me nothing going ashore. And uh, he pointed out to where the building was, and I started to hunt for it and couldn't find it. And to beat the man, it was uh, uh, not a clear sailing all the time. That place was full of docks and there was bridges uh, now and again and I come to one bridge and it just starts to come up on each side and standing up vertically to let the string uh, other ships through and then down again. I spent about half an hour waiting there until it, until I could cross and I ran and ran and inquired and uh, wore out a pair of shoes and, and uh, about just about five o'clock, I came in front of a building and looked up, and uh, it was marked in a big letter there, uh, Holland Water Scout. So <laughs> I don't know how I'll get it. So I goes in, and it was just on five o'clock, and there was a young German behind the counter. He was just about going to close the pigeonhole down. When I put in front, pushed in front of discharge, I said, that wants to be stamped and discharged uh, and signed so that uh, I could get another job. And he took it and put a stamp on and his signature, and he said, one golden, please. <laughs> now I was in a cart. I pushed my hand in my pocket and took the whole lot of the change and put it in front of him. And he looked at it and at me, and then he started to count and eventually pushed a whole lot towards me and said to me, oh, sort of sneeringly, next time you come ashore, don't booze all your money up before you are clear. But anyway, I thanked him and off I went. And because I could find the station, all right, I found the station and in one corner of the place was a, a sort of eating shop. And I went and bought myself a long loaf of French bread and uh, a pint of milk. And I went in one corner, sat down, and oh, enjoyed that down to the ground. I never had a better Christmas dinner before.